curious little me couldn't help but look inside. There, I saw wadded up paper towels drenched in blood and hair. One night, Craig literally got on top of me in my room, put his knees on my arms and started to strangle me. But there was still a small part of me that worried something terrible had happened to whoever was in the vehicle, and I thought I needed to help. Headphones recommended. Listener discretion advised. Welcome back in, everyone. I'm your host, Chad. You're just moments away from true tales of terror that will leave you breathless. So brace yourself. This is Disturbed. Here we are, folks, back at it again. A new week brings some new horror stories. Now, our first experience is our title story and comes courtesy of Reddit user Wicked Dude. Everyone has a secret, especially the candy lady. Performing this experience is Matt Bradford. When I was 12 years old, my family and I lived in an old apartment complex. I say old because it had been standing for well over 50 years by the time we moved in. Some residents had claimed to have lived there their whole lives. Anyway, one particular thing that stuck out to me was that there was a strict no pets policy. Now the landlord actually elaborated on this, stating that a copious number of pets seemed to go missing around the area, and they now restricted pets in hopes that it would end that problem there. As a child, I kept pretty much to myself. As for my brothers, who were two to three years older than me, they spoke and played with every kid that lived in the apartment and the surrounding areas. Every day after school, they'd beg our mother for some change so they could visit the candy lady. As she was a local resident in the apartments who held a mini-mart in her apartment. You know, basically, she'd buy snacks in bulk, ranging from gummy snacks to chips, so she can resell it to the neighborhood kids. I'd never been at that point but was of course curious. I had asked my brothers if I could join them and well, they declined. So I stole, you know, a dollar from my mom's purse and followed my brothers and their friends so I could find out where she lived. Upon stalking them, I finally found out her apartment location. Though they stayed inside for a while, I figured I'd just go the next day. The next day after school, I took my stolen dollar and headed out to the candy lady's apartment. When she opened the door, she was an older Caucasian lady with a welcoming demeanor. She let me in and asked for my name. When I gave it to her, I asked for hers. She said to just call her the candy lady, and she seemed sweet and thoughtful, asking me about school and if I lived in the area. Kids don't usually come here alone. Where are your friends? She asked me. I explained that I don't really have any and that I prefer to just observe. She seemed to sympathize with me because she then told me to take anything I wanted free of charge. As a child, I indulged taking as much as I could carry. While thanking her on my way out, she said to me, Come back any time, my friend. I felt pretty jolly at that point. And one, I got free snacks. Two, I actually made a friend. When I got home, I hid my snacks in my drawers, returned my mother's stolen dollar, and felt great overall. That is, until I went back. I returned maybe three to four days after the first time. When I knocked, she answered the door frantically. I kind of got scared, so I told her I could just come back later. After realizing it was me, she told me no worries and insisted I come in. When I did, she asked if I'd come back for more free snacks. I gleefully told her yes, but she said that the first time was a kind gesture. But from now on, I'd have to help her with a few things to earn my free snacks. I was used to working for things, so I agreed. It was simple enough, just throw out her trash for her. I figured she was old and probably couldn't go outside much. 
And weird thing is, she had me take her garbage out to the dumpsters in the apartments next door. Fast forward to a month later, it had become our regular schedule. After school, I'd do my homework, then head out over to her place to throw her garbage as well as collect my earnings. It was all easy breezy for a while. That is, until one day she didn't tie the trash bag all the way. I walked all the way down to the dumpsters next door, and before I threw it in, I decided I'd tie it first. It was loose, so I had to untie it to fix it all the way, and curious little me couldn't help but look inside. There, I saw wadded up paper towels drenched in blood and hair. There was also more black plastic bags at the bottom of the bag. This freaked me out so much that I, I just dropped the bag right then and there and booked it home. As soon as I got home, I cried to my mother about my discovery. She said she'd go out and see it for herself after I told her which dumpster. When she returned, she said she didn't see what was inside because the candy lady was already there throwing it out when she arrived. My mother didn't say a word to her and just left. She told me she didn't want me going out that far anymore and stop helping with other people's chores, completely neglecting what I had initially told her. Surprisingly, I was able to just forget, well, more like ignore, what happened and go about my kid life like nothing happened. Then, my brothers came rushing back home one day. They anxiously explained to my mom, who was as nosy as ever regarding neighbors, that the candy lady was taken away by the police. My mother dismissed it and told us to mind our business. My brothers were bummed out because of their future lack of snacks. As a child at this point in time, I didn't really understand police and all that, so I was pretty much clueless about what happened. About a month ago, I had dinner with my mom. I am now 22 years old, by the way. My mother and I got to reminiscing and we started talking about those old apartments. After discussing how old and broke down they were, I asked if she remembered what I told her. Now, at first, she did it. Then, I mentioned that she was arrested by the police. Then, the shock of realization hit her. She said she remembered, and that she actually asked the landlord about it shortly after she was taken away. Apparently, the landlord told her that the candy lady was actually killing and skinning animals she found nearby. So, she's the reason why pets weren't allowed. She was fucking killing them and doing God knows what with the skin. And I'm the dumbass little kid who got rid of the evidence for her. And for those of you wondering, the management of the apartments next to ours, the ones with the dumpsters we used to dispose of the evidence, caught wind of the smell reeking from the dumpsters. And from there, they were able to catch the candy lady. All I know is, I'm glad I never went back once I realized what was in the bags of trash she had me take out multiple times. And to the crazy candy lady... Let's never meet again. P.S. If you're the candy lady reading this, I refuse to believe you were my first friend. A giant thank you to all of our newest Patreon members. Your support directly contributes to a higher quality show. Morgan South, Eric Price, Nathan, Nicholas Griffey, Marie Nellore, Isidore Sanchez, and Cheyenne Franks. Thanks so much for supporting the show. They're all enjoying an ad-free listening experience, early access, and our bonus series of disturbing calls. If you need an extra fix of Disturbed, or you just love the show and want to show your support, visit patreon.com slash disturbedpodcast to join and get your exclusive access today. Next up, we hear from Reddit user Moomin Goober. Unfortunately, she had to find out that best friends can be abusive too. Performing this experience is Nicole Doolin. I'm posting here as I think I'm finally ready to tell my story. I moved to Sandback in Cheshire, England around three to four years ago with an ex. He and I had broken up by this point and were just friends in the house we rented and everything was great. We weren't hostile towards each other and found out we were better friends than in a relationship. 
I started going out to the bars and local shops to make friends and see if anyone was as lonely as I was by this point. I had moved from Chelsea, London to be with my ex, and I didn't know anyone there. This was when I met Craig. He and I became best friends quickly. He was a little odd, had family in the area and his own flat, etc. So my ex moved away back with his family and I couldn't afford the rent on my own. So Craig and I rented our house in Worcester, where his dad lived. His dad would be five minutes drive away from the house we settled at. He and I were just best friends. We didn't do anything romantically or sexually, and he always had a few poor girls in tow. He would tell each of them that they were the one for him, he loved them, etc. He had around seven girls on the go at one point. I started seeing this guy, Jay. He would stay over a few times and would eventually become my boyfriend. Craig hated it. We would argue about him. The fact that why should he care anyway? He and I were only best friends and he needed to stay out of my dating life. It was then that things got physical. One night, Craig literally got on top of me in my room, put his knees on my arms and started to strangle me. He was saying things like, Where is he now? And I honestly thought I was going to die. My brain switched to my mum, who was four to five hours away, and she would never know or would have to come identify the body of her only child. I don't know what it was, but I managed to kick Craig and I ran. He had double locked the front door. He had hidden my bag and had smashed my new iPhone that I had gotten from my parents for my birthday. I was literally running down the stairs with him in tow, yelling how he's going to kill me, etc., I knew the back door was open from him having a smoke earlier. And there was a garden gate. All I needed to do was open that. I ran for it, opened it, and made it. The next thing, I'm out on the street in short shorts and a pajama top, barefoot. I just ran. I ran for a good half an hour towards town and used a payphone to call 999. The police picked me up. I couldn't get back into the house as Craig had my door key. I told them the story. They took me to the station. Had to unlock it as it was past one in the morning by now. They took photos of my neck that had bruising and my head that was bleeding where he had smashed me into the kitchen wall earlier. I had to sit in a patrol car to go to my house and they picked Craig up. He was on the streets looking for me. I had to point him out and say that's him to them. He said he was out looking for me as he was worried for me. I don't think that's true. I think he was out looking for me to silence me so I didn't tell anyone. They arrested him and I got told he would stay in a cell overnight and a policeman let me into my house as they used a key Craig had. While I was in the house alone, I gathered my things. I had left my laptop, some clothes shoes and makeup in the rush I thought I could easily replace them and I just wanted to get away and I was so worried he would come back any second through the front door I had no purse, no money, no phone my parents lived five hours away thankfully I don't know why but I had the sense to hide my car key in my bra earlier that evening I got into my car and drove to Morrison's petrol station I was bleeding from my head. No shoes on and bruised. I broke down there and used their phone to call my mum. At first she was annoyed that I had woken her up. But then I explained everything to her. She ended up putting 200 pounds in the petrol cashier's account for me to fill my car up. Get some food and a hot drink to calm down. I then drove to my parents... I later got told through friends of a friend that Craig got released in the morning, as it was his word against mine, and he smashed my laptop up when he found out I wasn't at home anymore. Whatever. My stuff got replaced, and I am now with an amazing guy who treats me like a queen. 
Sometimes I get flashbacks of the night where I truly believe I could have died. As for Craig, I blocked him, deleted everything to do with his family and him, changed my number, and even broke off friendships with friends that knew me and him. Please, let's never meet again, because this time I'll be ready for you. Pizza delivery can be an interesting job. You run into all different types of people. Reddit user Cecil McKinley lets us know how a bit of crafty engineering potentially saved his life. Performing this experience is Tom Aglio. This is going to take a while to explain, so stay with me. It all comes around. My very first car was a dark green 2000 Volkswagen Jetta. It was the most basic of basics when it came to cars. No options whatsoever except for an automatic transmission. It was $300. Slow, dumpy, no right headlight, drove straight with the steering wheel practically sideways, let out a cloud of white smoke when started, every stereotype of a poor high schooler's car you can think of. My car was no exception. Despite it being a piece of German crap, I loved that car. I drove it every chance I had. I don't think a day went by that I didn't drive it. I named it Thunder Bunny. She was my baby, my beautiful green baby. But Volkswagens from that generation, Jettas especially, had a pretty bad flaw in the automatic transition. I'm not sure exactly what causes it, but essentially the transmissions gradually get worse and worse until the car will not shift into third gear. And there's not a thing you can do from there. So a couple weeks after Halloween 2019, I was going about 30 miles per hour when the engine suddenly roared and the car wouldn't speed up. I feared the worse, and my fears were justified. My dad, a mechanic, didn't even have hope for my baby. She was gone already, and so, much to my dismay, we started looking for a new car. It only took about a month for us to find her, a dark green 1999 Volkswagen Jetta. Exactly like my old car, but absolutely everything. She was faster, had heated leather seats, auto windows, auto sunroof, everything. All except for an automatic transmission. I knew how to drive manual, so it was perfect. I had a new baby, from the crackhead neighbor girl to Scarlett Johansson, at least in my eyes. I loved that car even harder, named it Little Boy, and was happy. Okay, I'm about to get to the story. But I have a few more quick things to explain. You can skip this if you want. It's important, but not vital to the story. First is for people that might not know, but when you have a manual car, you cannot leave it in gear and take your foot off the clutch. If you do, the car will stall, which is bad. So if you do leave your car in gear, you need to turn the engine off before taking your foot off the clutch. If you want to turn the car off or have it turn itself off, you need to pull the handbrake or it will roll away. Guess what the only really broken thing in my car was at the point this story takes place? If you guessed the handbrake, you're right, and that was the second thing. No handbrake. Okay, now to the story. I started working as a pizza delivery driver in a smaller, growing town in Michigan. It was good money, but every once in a while I delivered to an incredibly sketchy place. I've had a few shotguns pulled on me. One night, about two months ago, I was delivery on a Friday. Usually Fridays are very busy, but this day was a little slow. So when a delivery came in at 8.30, a half an hour before we closed, I jumped on it. I realized it was 7.1 miles away, so all of the closing jobs would be done by the time I got back, and I would have been able to leave immediately. It was way out of town in a wood-surrounded neighborhood, but again, no work when I got back to the store. Seemed like a good deal to me, and I'm all about those sorts of deals. And so I climbed into my car and went to drive 7.1 miles away. As I pulled up to the house, I began to get a bad feeling. The house was in a small trailer park-type neighborhood next to a lake, the kind that the houses are all a good distance apart with a likely drug problem, and was completely dark. No lights inside, none outside. There was a single car in the driveway and an open window on the side of the house. I pulled in behind the car in the driveway and sat there for a moment. Something was off. By the house being completely dark, I mean there wasn't so much as a nightlight that I could see. Usually when I deliver to a dark house, there's at least a light on upstairs or something that would signal someone being awake, waiting for their pizza. But the house seemed dead. Nevertheless, I put the car in gear, 
turned off the engine, grabbed the small, cheapest pizza we had, and got out. Without my headlights on, there was nothing. I could barely see the house. The only light was the dim moon. I walked onto the porch and passed the big open window to the front door. As I reached the front door, I saw it. The door was slightly cracked open, just enough for me to see into the void of the house. Thinking of every single horror movie I've ever seen, I said aloud, fuck that, and hurried back to my car. I'm a tall, well-built looking guy, but despite my wide shoulders and baggy hoodie, I'm a frail thing and I can hardly fight off a small dog. I got into my car and turned on the engine. My headlights illuminated the house and almost simultaneously the living room light behind the big open window lit up and a single guy looked out and walked to the front door. I cussed myself and weighed my options. If I went up to the door, I could die. If I noped out of there, I would 110% be fired. That meant no new car part, no gas money, no cute dates with my girl, just sitting at home doing virtual schoolwork. It was a stupid choice, I know, but I grabbed the pizza and opened my door. Making a choice I'm damn glad I made. I took the car out of gear and climbed out. Mostly so my engine would still be running so that if I needed, I could run back and immediately take off. I walked to the door where the man had opened it the rest of the way. As I got closer, I got a good look at him. I'm not one to judge a person based on their physical appearance, but this guy's head was cleanly shaven and was covered in tattoos. He was wearing a pair of gray jeans and a white tank top. He had a scowl on his face and was staring me dead in the eyes. I looked past him for a moment into the house, which was completely empty. As I got close enough that I started opening the pizza bag, he started to reach around his waist. I stopped. He was staring at me with the most evil grin I've ever seen. I knew in that moment that I was about to die. I had always heard your life seems to flash before your eyes. I thought about my girl and that she wouldn't know what happened. My work would stop delivering upon my disappearance, assuming that my body wasn't ever found. My dad would regret telling me he was happy for me landing this job. God save thee. That's when I heard it, that distinct sound of gravel under tires. My only pathetically small chance of escape was rolling away. I didn't even look back at the car to know that. I just stared at the man and was about to say, fuck you, when he looked back to my car. I heard the sound of the car rolling. It was getting closer. The guy's eyes went from the driveway to behind me. I finally looked over my shoulder. My car had rolled backwards and had come to a smooth stop near the mailbox of the house. I looked back at the guy who had a nervous look. He looked back at me and scowled again and took his hand from around his waist. He reached in his front pocket and took out $12 and handed it to me. I gave him the pizza and watched him slam the door shut. I ran back to my car and practically tore the door off trying to get in. I looked back at the house and the man was standing in front of the window staring out at me. You better believe I nearly spun the tires on my way out of there. I kept glancing at my mirrors until I started driving under streetlights. It was easily the scariest moment I've ever had. As soon as I got back to the store, I told my boss about it and she called the police. We never heard anything about it. I assume they went to the house and only found a small cheese pizza. I started carrying a knife on me at all times and my boss is considering getting trackers for our pizza bags. Only recently I realized this is sort of a butterfly effect. I thought it was the worst thing ever that my transmission went out and I cursed Volkswagen for designing such a terrible automatic transmission. But if that transmission was still working, then I would have still had that car when this happened. I would have put the car in park and it would have sat there while whatever would have happened to me happened. I have zero doubts in my mind that the man was planning on murdering me. So shitty German engineering saved me from getting murdered. Hey everyone, Nicole Goodnight here, letting you know that this episode is made possible by Factor. Do you struggle to find the time and energy to consistently eat healthy? You're not alone, and there's a solution. Introducing Factor, the all-in-one meal delivery service that preps, cooks, and delivers fresh, never frozen, fully prepared meals directly to your door weekly. With Factor, every meal is designed by dietitians and handcrafted by world-class chefs, keeping your taste buds happy and your waistline trim. What's more, the menu changes every week, so you never lose interest in eating healthy. Right now, Factor is offering disturbed listeners $50 off over their first two weeks. Just go to factor75.com, pick your meals, and use code PODCAST50 at checkout to claim this limited-time offer. That's factor75.com 
Code PODCAST50. Support for this podcast comes from Progressive. Saving money on your car insurance is easy with Progressive. It's an average savings of $796 for customers who switch and save. In fact, customers can qualify for an average of six discounts on their auto policy with Progressive, including discounts just for starting a quote online or owning multiple vehicles. Get your quote online at Progressive.com and see how much you could be saving. National average annual car insurance savings by new customer surveyed who saved with Progressive in 2019. Discounts vary and are not available in all states and situations. Now back to the show. Sometimes you just need to get away and clear your mind. Many people choose to go for a drive to help decompress. Reddit user Princess Siren had a day where she needed to do just that. Unfortunately for her, that drive turned into an outright nightmare. Performing this experience is Aaron Lillis. To preface this, I love to drive. Like, hours-long drives to nowhere with no destination in mind. Just me my music, and the road ahead of me. Living in Nebraska, I'd often take back roads or lonely highways, cutting through the countryside to small towns and eventually cities. And I'd usually take these drives at night since there was less traffic to worry about. I've done it since I've had my license four or five years ago and have never once had any sort of issue, nor have I ever run into any trouble. That was until a few nights ago. For reference, I'm a relatively small 22-year-old female, and as I've stated before, I often take these drives completely and utterly alone. They're a good way to clear my head when I'm stressed, upset, or overwhelmed, or for me to get a plan together to sort personal issues out. I've also done these long and lonely drives to get away from the toxicity of my household when I used to live with my parents as a means of coping with their alcoholism. Though now that I've moved out and in a much better place mentally, I don't really have the urge to get in my car and just drive anymore. However, on the night this event took place, I was feeling pretty overwhelmed, stressed, and anxious with a clusterfuck of personal issues I'd rather not get into. I felt restless and irritable around my boyfriend, couldn't focus on anything else, and decided I would take a drive to clear my head. My boyfriend was understanding and told me to be careful and to not be gone for too terribly long since it was getting pretty late. I agreed, gave him a kiss goodbye, and left. I drove around our city for about 30 minutes, but I was still feeling on edge about everything transpiring in my personal life. So I decided to drive further north down those familiar, dark, winding, one-lane highways. I kept the car at a steady 65 miles per hour taking the turns at a slower pace in case a deer jumped out around the bend and was just admiring the vast, empty darkness of the snow-capped fields and barren trees. It was honestly a bit creepy being all alone with no cars in sight, in seemingly the middle of nowhere. The few houses miles back from the road, lightless, and the dead cornfields withered away and covered in the snow. It was like something out of a horror movie, and I half expected to see a ghost pop up in my rearview mirror or see someone clamber out from the patches of trees dotting the horizon. The only light came from my headlights, and even then I still strained to see through the inky darkness of the night. By now it was just after 11, and I told myself that once I made the familiar roundabout that would either take you to a small town or back up towards the city, I would head back to the city and home. That roundabout was still maybe 15 to 25 minutes away, but other than my imagination picturing the worst, I wasn't really all that concerned. I mean, I was by myself. I didn't have any other motorists to worry about, right? Wrong. As I'm rounding another bend, I notice a vehicle with its hazards flashing, maybe a quarter of a mile or something away from me. It was some sort of sedan, dark colored, and was angled to where only part of it was on the shoulder while the rest was jutted out onto the road like they had to pull over in a hurry, but didn't quite manage to do that. The driver's side door was flung wide open, and as I slowed my vehicle down and angled it towards the opposite side of the road to pass, I could make out what looked like maybe blood on the inside of the open door. I didn't see anyone on the road or in the car, and I was the only motorist in sight. Cell phone reception is spotty at best in this part of the country, 
but more often than not, you couldn't get reception no matter how hard you prayed, which was definitely the case when I took a glance at my phone to see if I had any service. So, a lone female on the road, at night, pulling up near a vacant vehicle that looks like someone had been attacked on the inside with no cell service. Now, I'm no dummy. I've watched countless episodes of Investigation Discovery and Criminal Minds and read far too many true crime books to know that this had bad and danger written all over it. But there was still a small part of me that worried something terrible had happened to whoever was in the vehicle, and I thought I needed to help. These roads don't get a lot of traffic late at night, and temperatures were well below freezing. If someone were hurt or in trouble, there was no one and nothing else to help them but me. Still, I erred on the side of caution. I was still driving my car, though a bit more slowly. And as I approached the vehicle, I rolled down my passenger window a bit, shut off the music, and called out. Hey, anyone there? Are you okay? I didn't hear a response. I worried they were passed out somewhere, but I wasn't about to get out and look for them. I told myself I'd call out one last time, and if I didn't hear anything, I would leave. And the moment there was reception, I'd call it in. And if I did hear someone, well, I'd figure out my next course of action then. So again, I shouted, Hey, what happened? Are you okay? There was silence for a beat, and then I heard rustling in the shadows of the trees, followed by a gruff voice saying, Yeah. I was relieved at first and was about to say something in response or possibly even stop my car and get out when I noticed three things nearly simultaneously. As I inched my way past the front of the sedan, I noticed there was no damage to the hood or anywhere else on the vehicle, which I found to be strange considering the blood on the inside of the door. In my rearview mirror, I caught a glance of someone coming out from behind the sedan and they were making their way towards my car fast. The person did not have any blood on them or appeared injured in any way, wearing a mask. Not like a face mask for COVID or a ski mask or anything normal, but one of those masks you would see in the Purge movies, and they were holding something in their hand. I don't know what it was, I couldn't get a good look, but from its length and shape, my guess was maybe a tire iron or a crowbar or something. I don't need to tell you that I slammed on the gas the moment I noticed those things and drove like a bat straight out of hell, my heart thundering in my chest and my entire body shaking. My window was still rolled down in my haste, and the music was still shut off so I could very clearly hear someone, definitely a man, shouting at me, though I had no clue what they were saying. I just knew I had to get out of there immediately. I stole one last look in my rearview mirror as I drove away, mostly to see if they were getting in their sedan to follow Chase or if they had stopped. The man with the weapon was still standing in the middle of the road watching me, and right before I looked away from the mirror, I saw a second man emerge from the trees that had been rustling earlier also wearing one of those creepy masks, and no trace of blood on him. I probably broke every law for speeding that night, but I wanted to get as far away from those men as possible. As soon as I made it to the roundabout, I turned towards town, parked in the Walmart parking lot that thankfully still had cars from who I assumed were workers closing up shop, and proceeded to have a full-on meltdown. When I could pull myself together, I called one of my friends, T, who was a police officer, to tell him what happened and what I should do. He was concerned for me, and after asking if I was okay, where I was, did they follow me, etc., he told me since it was out of city limits, he couldn't do much on his end, but he could get in contact with the local police and sheriff in that jurisdiction to take my statement and check it out. I agreed, thanked him, and while I waited for police to show up, I called my boyfriend. Through my hysterical sobs and panic, I managed to tell him what happened not even 10 or so minutes ago. He was, as you can imagine, super freaked for my safety and wanted me to either come home immediately or drive down himself to take me home. I told him the police were on their way to take my statement so I couldn't leave and that I was okay, but I stayed on the phone with him until I saw the familiar police cruisers pulling into the lot. I gave the police my statement and they assured me they would go back to the spot I told them the sedan had been to take a look and that they would try to catch the guys who did it, though with no cameras and no description of the men, I wasn't sure they'd be able to. I didn't even get the license plate number, though at the time of my panic, the thought never came to mind until the police were asking if I got it. All they had to go off of was a dark-colored sedan and two guys with masks. After I gave my statement, I went home and stayed curled up close to my boyfriend the whole night, listening to every sound the house made in fear it would be those guys arriving any minute to finish whatever it was they started. Since the incident, I haven't heard back from the police about whether or not they have any leads, and I'm not sure they ever will. 
I'm just thankful I'm still here and that I didn't stop my car or get out. I'm not sure what would have become of me if I had. I still have so many questions that have no answers. What were they doing? Why? Was that blood on the inside of the car or just a ruse to get more attention? If it was really blood, did they hurt someone else? What would have happened to me if I'd stopped my car? Needless to say, I won't be going on any more late night drives to anywhere, and I hope I never cross paths with those freaks again. Before we close the book on this episode, let's hear a listener voicemail. Hey, it's Emily from Victoria, Australia. Just saying that I really enjoy your show. I work outside, so I listen to your podcast throughout my day, and it really helps me get the work done. So, thanks. Thanks, Emily, for listening all the way from Australia. Now, if you want your voice heard on the show, leave us a message on the hotline. 701-354-3667. Disturbed is a Disturbed Media original podcast. Musical score by White Bat Audio, Co.ag, and Kevin Hartnell. Thanks for listening. We'll be back next Thursday with a brand new episode. And stay safe out there, y'all.